The Iranian Revolution unsettled Cold War alliances, particularly those between the Second and the Third World. For Muslims in Yugoslavia, committed to socialist non-aligned solidarities, the revolution offered an alternative reading of Islam and the emancipatory struggle for justice. For some, the revolution was personal. Richard Kafka was shocked at the sight of the precocious 12 years old Amir, linking his last name to the famed writer. Amir had rushed to translate for the 1984 Sarajevo Olympics visitor on the tram as the only passenger who understood English. Thanking Amir for his help, Kafka asked the little Sarayli about the parade in the center of the city. It was the first time I learned the word birthday in English, remembers Amir, as he had struggled to explain to the American visitor that every year, on Tito's birthday, Yugoslav youth passed a torch through Yugoslav cities, towns and villages, on its way to Belgrade, symbolically celebrating the commitment to the future of socialism. Baffled by the 12 years old, Richard Kafka could have never guessed Amir's Kafkaesque nightmare. It had been almost a year that his mother had been sentenced to five years in prison. The accused Melika Salibegovic, father Haki and mother Najia Neprohic, Born in January 1945 in Sarajevo, Muslim, citizen of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, author, divorced mother of a 12 years old child, literate, elementary and secondary school education, graduate of the Faculty of Political Sciences in Zagreb, owns no property, no prior convictions, permanently residing in Sarajevo, the Sarajevo process of 1983 would convict Malika of betrayal of his socialist ideals under Articles 114 and 136 of the Criminal Code of Yugoslavia. Her counter-revolutionary activities, argued the Sarajevo District Court, had sought to subvert the socialist order under the influence of the Iranian Revolution. the Iranian Revolution of 1979 and its critique of colonialism resonated deeply with the rest of the Muslim world. It had incited the imagination of Malika too. Bringing forth a new language, Ali Shariati, the spiritual leader of the revolution, anchored his anti-colonial resistance on Islam unearthing the history of Shiism through Imam Hussein's martyrdom at the Battle of Karbala. Malika was introduced to Iranian decolonial praxis in Paris of the early 70s, where she pursued her doctoral studies on temporality and Paul Clay's work. In Paris, she grew close to Iranian revolutionaries and exiles who exposed her to Islamic liberation theology and to the decolonial critique of the continuation of colonial regimes through former decolonization. She was familiarized with the Eurocentric binary rhetoric of communism versus liberalism, of secularism versus religion, where Europe figured always as a universal, a non-European thought as a particular. Yes, 
On March 24, 1983, at 5.30 a.m., the bell rang at the apartment on Albanska Street No. 1. I thought it was the poet Abdullah Sidran, recalls Amir, as he had a tendency to come over around that time. Drunk as he was from nights out, he would ring and come over to crash at our place. It was not Sidran. After five hours of raiding the apartment, Yugoslav secret service agents in civilian clothes arrested his mother and told Amir to lock the door and not to contact anyone. I never slept after that night. At the police station, Melika would be questioned for 40 hours nonstop. On the following night, she was taken to the Sarajevo Central Prison. At her request that she be allowed to see her son, she was told to be satisfied with her condition, as in your Muslim countries, political prisoners are executed. In a semi-public trial, prosecutors presented a letter Malika had written to Ayatollah Khomeini as a central proof of her guilt. For 37 years, she wrote, I have been living in a Christian environment in atheistic Europe, in an environment where a handful of frightened Muslims live, surrounded by an atmosphere of lies and hypocrisy. It is therefore not surprising that my youth, as well the youth of thousands of my compatriots, has been spent in wandering aimlessly down the paths of ignorance. It is no wonder that we are returning to Allah. The more submissive we are, the greater our desperation. The state security services provided the court with intercepted conversations. Melika, claimed the apparatchiks, was recorded saying that the state-sanctioned Islamic organizations did not work for the benefit of the Muslims and Islam, but instead they did what the authorities ordered them to do. That the Reis Ululema, the head of the Muslim communities of Yugoslavia, was controlled by the authorities that Muslims were unequal in status compared to Serbs, that there was no freedom of writing in Bosnia, that authorities did not allow religious freedoms, and that believers did not enjoy equality with atheists. The establishment of the non-aligned movement in Belgrade in September 1961 had given voice to the hopes and dreams of billions of recently decolonized people to participate in generating new solidarities of the subaltern worlds. Between 1955 and 1979, the non-aligned movement grew from 25 to 117 member countries. It allowed Muslims from Yugoslavia to communicate extensively with Muslims throughout non-aligned countries, participating in a previously unimagined exchange of ideas. Syrian, Iraqi and Palestinian students studied in Yugoslav universities, while Bosnians, Macedonians and Albanians worked in Yugoslav development projects in Damascus, Cairo and Baghdad. On a break from her studies in 1977, Malika visited her brother Yakub in Iraq's capital, Baghdad. Yakub, like hundreds of Yugoslavs, was in the Middle East to service Yugoslavia's non-aligned ambitions. By then, Malika's excitement about the non-aligned movement had given way to disillusionment. She came to think of it as another Eurocentric approach to decolonization. Mm. 
As Yugoslavia grew in prominence in the non-aligned world, Muslims in Yugoslavia saw their country's international self-position as, as hypocritical given the discriminatory conditions of Muslims within the country itself. Muslims were not recognized as a constitutive people of Yugoslavia until the constitutional reforms of 1971. Practicing Muslims were still kept away from decision-making positions in favor of secular Muslims who were frequently rewarded for implementing emancipatory projects on their own communities. The later were known as good Muslims. Malika resisted what she saw as the incorporation of Islam in the service of Yugoslavia's foreign affairs at the expense of continued othering of Muslims at home. The journey to Imam Hussein's shrine in Karbala radically changed her life. Resolved to embrace the wholeness of Islamic life, she returned to Yugoslavia wearing the chador, officially banned since the 1950s. In late September 1980, Melika attended a meeting of the communist writers in Belgrade wearing a chador. Her colleagues thought it was a performance piece. The Yugoslav postmodern hub of the early 80s, at the peak of its artistic and intellectual creation, lacked the vocabulary for political acts. Unlike Belgrade, Zagreb, and Ljubljana, the centers of intellectual production, whose points of reference were Berlin, Paris, or London, Sarajevo produced a different kind of publics for Yugoslav consumption. In Sarajevo, hippies were discovering Muslim urban slang and music. Calling themselves neo-primitivists, they merged their interest in Western New Age spirituality with Yugoslavia's own stereotypes of lazy Muslim peasants who moved into the city and refused to integrate. The bizarre fusion seeped into movies, TV shows, music, and jokes. It went mainstream, providing relief to the Yugoslav upper middle classes from the economic crisis that was just beginning. In 1982, Malika sold everything she owned and bought a one-way ticket to Iran for herself and Amir. Amir adapted quickly to his new surroundings in Tehran, becoming popular among his peers as he quickly picked up Persian. He appeared on Iranian TV, reciting surahs by heart. The violence of the post-revolutionary Iran proved disastrous for his mother. Refused asylum by the Iranian government, betrayed, they returned to Yugoslavia. After turning in her Communist League membership card, Melika was fired from her job at the Cultural Educational Association of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Her literary work banned. She was shunned from any participation in public life. Following her release from prison in 1988, Melika moved back to Iran. Betrayed by the Islamist decolonial utopia she and her comrades had dreamt of, she became an iterant exile. No single place could hold her. In the 1990s, she traveled throughout the Middle East, 
soliciting support and solidarity to confront the ongoing genocides of Muslims in Bosnia. Returning to Sarajevo during the siege, in the face of the murder of her brother, friends and relatives, her worst fears had become a living nightmare. The last genocide on our people, she argues, cannot be understood outside the sustained and structural dehumanizations of Muslims in Yugoslavia. The post-war fragmentation of Bosnia in her eyes is not an exception to this designation of Muslims in the Balkans as a disposable and destabilizing presence that must be destroyed, but an organized cultivation of Europe as a white, Christian secular vitality, sustained through the death-making of all others that can only exist as temporary guests or future ghosts. Yugo nostalgia, like European amnesia, refuses accountability for its contingent crimes, lest they are remembered as isolated and transient acts of accidental madness. They call it progress. Ovdje što piše, znači, to, je, to su riječi hadzici kuci, odnosno riječi Allaha Đulešanhu koji nisu ušli u Kur'an i koje znače ispraznje jednu kuću zame, ja sam s onima slomljenoga srca. To znači da čovjek kad želi da postigne ljubav i blizinu apsuta treba da, da isprazni svoju kuću, svoje srce od svih drugih idola.